I'm Ray Will here with this week's interview chair brought to you by Canine Chronicle TV and Pro Plan. This week on the chair is one of my very favorites, and he hates my calling this, but Dr. Michael Woods. So sit back and relax and listen to Michael for the next hour. Hi, everybody. Will here with this week's interview chair. And this week, uh, sitting on the chair is Dr. Michael Woods. How are you, doctor? I'm well, very well. Thank you. Well. I just called you doctor twice. I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> so things are well. How's the weather down there? The weather is actually not too bad. It's a pretty calm day. We've had our first little bit of snow. Uh, we had a small blizzard the other day. But other than that, it's been great. Is that your first snow? That is our really first snow, yeah. Wow. We've had snow. We've had like three different seasons already this year. It's crazy. So That's why everyone's moving to Halifax. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Tell the people how you first got involved in our sport of dogs and how old you were. Uh, well, it's a bit of a long story. That's what uh, I'm here for. Okay. Growing up, we always had animals around the house, you know, from goldfish, turtles, cats, dogs. Because my grandfather was a deep sea captain, he used to sail from Newfoundland to uh, the Caribbean, to Brazil, uh, to Portugal, and over to England. And then back under sail, uh, he uh, always was bringing back exotic animals. So we frequently had cats, not just cats and dogs, but we uh, quite often had parrots and monkeys in the house. So I grew up with animals. We always had a dog, but we never really had uh, any purebred dogs. So when my wife and I first got married, we decided we'd like a dog. So being an academic, I decided I should do some research on that. So we looked at all a lot of breeds, but the three breeds we kind of focused mostly on were Siberians because they're such a beautiful breed. Uh, I've always had an affection for bull terriers, so we looked at bull terriers and, of course, Labradors. So we went to a friend uh, in Newfoundland, and she had two Labradors, and one of them was a dog from England, the yellow dog, who was just an absolutely wonderful dog. He wasn't the best type, uh, but he had a beautiful temperament, so we kind of fell in love with the breed. And we were going to have kids, so we really wanted to have a dog that was good with uh, good with children. So I did everything right. I did all the research. I got recommendations from people. Uh, we ordered a, brought a dog in from England, and he was a. I didn't know much about Labradors, but when I looked at him coming out of the crate, you could just say, "Oh my God, what a beautiful dog!" Wow. So uh, we did that. that. All the rules you say follow, we followed. Six months later, the dog couldn't walk. We didn't know what was the matter with it. We were novices. Brought him to the vet. He basically had no hip joints. Uh, Now, this was back in the 70s, early 70s. So we said, what can can you do? Basically, the vet at that point in time said, you have to keep him in a cage for like a year and a half or something. We'd have to do both hips. And I said, that's just inhuman to do that to the dog. So he said the only other thing you can have is have him put down. So we had the dog put down. It was a really traumatic experience. So I'm always very conscious of, of our responsibilities as breeders. Uh, when we sell a lot of our pets, the dogs, as you know, to pet homes, um, we have an enormous responsibility, I think, to make sure that we're selling healthy dogs to these people. Um Anyway, I decided that if I was going to get in Labradors, I would do it the right way. So we took a year off with a six-month-old kid, knowing nobody, went to England and lived there for a year. Visited wow. every county, 
all the kennels over there, all the old kennels, Glen Broadley, Sandy Lands. That's Lance. commitment. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. So it was fun anyway. So we mm-hmm. went there and had a great time. Uh, fell in with a really good group of people that were not dog related, but we visited, I think, every kennel in England. And Peggy Ray, who was Cornlands, had beautiful dogs, took us under our wing, under her wing. Uh, we took a lot. We, we had a number of pups that we looked at, got them x rayed, they were all HD. Uh, so in those days in England, they weren't really doing very much with uh, with HD. They were really into PRA, but they thought if a dog wasn't limping, it didn't have HD. We finally got two really good dogs, um, got them cleared, brought them back to Canada. Um, one of them was a phenomenal obedience dog out of Ballyduff Kennel, Bridge of Docking. Uh, the other one was a dog out of Powhatan Kennel, um, one was yellow, one was black. The yellow dog was a phenomenal obedience dog, one of the best in show, but I don't think he had the best kind of type in the world. But he's the dog I love most of all the dogs I've ever had. Uh, the black dog had wonderful type, uh, went to the States, finished with five majors. Um, people kind of looked at him and said, well, we'd like to use that dog. One person actually came to Newfoundland to breed to the dog. And uh, after that, we frequently went to the U.S. and showed in the during the summers. So those are your first two dogs. You, those were my first two dogs. Well, real, yeah. After yeah your and, we went from, and then we went from there. So we were we were very lucky in that we had some well, really good... luck. You took a year off and researched it and then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a lot. I think you had, was, some hand, you had a hand in it, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> but we were lucky that we, we ran into some really good people there and some really good people in the States. The person that came up to breed to the dog was a gentleman called George White. Uh, who bred uh, oh, bred and judged Labradors, but only Labradors did he judge. Uh, we became really good, close to him, like family. He was, he, they, we were like part of their family. We're still very close to uh, to his um, his daughter uh, Claire White Peterson, who breeds Labradors. Uh, is kind of known as Mrs. Chocolate in the U.S., I think. Uh, and uh, so we still have a, a great family relationship there. Um, George was a great guy, great man, wonderful handler. Uh, if we were really wanted to win a, at a dog show, George would handle our dogs for us, just as a friend. Uh, and then I'd take another dog that was not going to be handled nearly as well. So, uh, so we were really lucky to have to have people like like him uh, help us out when we started. That's a good start, Doc. Yeah. Michael, I almost called you Doctor again. <laughs> <laughs> And you had those two dogs, and then you, obviously you started breeding after that. So. Yeah, How we started you... breeding. We went to uh, we 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 with somebody else bought a, a dog a bitch over from Folly Tower. Folly Tower was another really well known camel at the time over there, and uh, we bred and we got the, I think one of the best bitches we've ever had out of that. She went and she won specially in the U.S. She finished really fast. Uh, so we went on. We went on from there. And did you, did you show a lot of the dogs yourself then? At that point, everything in Canada that I showed, I showed myself. Uh, in the U.S., uh, George probably showed more dog, more of our dogs than I did. I, I was kind of like the backup handler down there. I mean, he uh, he knew everybody, and he was a way better handler than I was. That was for sure. Um, so yeah, he, he was really kind to us. And as I say, it was, it was just one friend helping out another friend in that case. Very good. Um, when did you decide how long before into your reading life, did you decide you wanted to become a judge? Well, I guess that was thrust upon me to a certain extent because we, we were fortunate that we made a name in the U S. Um, and people would ask me to judge, um, at sanction matches, open shows, uh, sweeps. And after a couple of times, I thought, wow, I really enjoy this. This is really great. Uh, so then I applied back here. First of all, I was an obedience judge. So I, I did obedience first. And then I applied for uh, for part half the sporting group. And from there on, uh, I just really enjoyed what I what I did. And uh and just kept and just kept going until I finally got to the Albury. To Wait, the Albury. What year did you start? Wow, uh, 
I think I think my first judging assignment might have my first permit might have been maybe in 70, 78, something like that, or somewhere around there, 78 or 80. You were just a youngster. Yeah, I was pretty I was pretty young at that time, but I'm not so young right now. <laughs> 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 well, we've known each other for a long time. Um, I think probably mid '80s when I first met you, but uh, yeah, I didn't know you've been judging that long. In the late '70s. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, yeah, it's uh, well into uh, 50 years now that I'm pretty much 50 years that I've been judging. Wow. Uh, but I still love it. I mean, I love going to the shows. I love judging the dogs. I love um, that. What what we're doing is something that you never get to the end of. People said, like, well, why do you love judging? And then my reason is, part of the reason, is that you never get to the end. You can never say, I know everything. Every time you go out, you have something that you learn, something new that you see. You're always responsible for trying to better yourself. Uh, the late, great, beloved Skip Stanbridge uh, did a seminar for us, and he said, uh, he broke it down economically and he said, you know, these people are paying you uh, pretty much close to uh, 10 to $12 an hour, a minute to judge their dogs. So, you know, $20, uh, $20 for two minutes. And uh, it's it's your responsibility to make sure that you're giving them their money's worth. And I've, as you can tell, I've never forgotten that. Yeah. Um, and I think you need to give the people their, their money's worth. So no matter if the dog is a horrible dog and you know you're not going to use it, that dog deserves its two and a half minutes. Um, and they also, I think, deserve a judge who is trying to do the best they can. We all make mistakes. I mean, every time I walk up from a show, I think, oh, my God, why did I do that? You know, and I'm sure every, most other judges do that, too. Well, we were on a panel together in uh, the fall in, in Calgary. And I'll tell you, I learned so much just watching you and learning. I, I watched you judge the one day, pretty well all of it, and I had judged the day before, I think. But I thought, oh, oh, I, all these things clicked to me when I was watching you, so I was really happy you were there. So, Yeah, well, I was happy that you were there watching it, actually, because it, uh, that, that, in a way, made me uh, even uh, more, to focus a little bit more on what I was doing. Uh, because I respect what you have done in dogs and your opinion on dogs, and uh, and there was a number of people around the ring, and you always think, oh, my God, I got to do a good job here. Like, it's like when you go to Westminster and there's, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 or 100 people around the ring, and they're all breeders and exhibitors, and you're thinking, my God, if I screw it up here, they're really going to say, what's the city? <laughs> uh, so that's a little bit of pressure, I think, that makes us better. Uh, mm, of course, I and, think so, too. Uh, yeah, so um, I'm I'm really, I, I love the judging. Uh I love the challenges that it has. I hate I hate the travel. Uh, the travel is just horrible, and it's getting worse. And yeah, it's getting difficult. Right now, I, I'm, I'm new at it. I'm still I'm starting to feel the travel too. So yeah, right now I mean I'm very selective about taking anything um, that 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 requires a long a long trip. Mm -hmm. uh, it really came home to me last summer when I did a show in Argentina was 24 hours airport to airport one leg was 13 hours i don't sleep on planes uh, so i was sitting there for 13 hours wondering what the heck are you doing <laughs> so, so when i came home i was so beat out because uh, on the way home i actually had to stop in texas and didn't actually come home till after four shows in texas so by the time i got home i was pretty worn out so i said yeah, let's let's be a little more sensible about those long shows, and basically, it's it's the travel. That's the only thing I just like about judging. I think is the travel. Well, when you're popular, people want you, Doc, um, Michael. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you, can, you know, you can fool some of the people some of the time. I guess but <laughs> all of the people all of the time. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned Skip Stanbridge. Do you have maybe he was one of your mentors in judging? Do you have, do you have other ones that were your that even the, they might not even know they were your mentors? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Jenny Lyon was one of the people that I really um, that really helped me out, and she's I think she is the iconic judge in Canada, in my opinion, for the last couple of generations. I mean, she is a phenomenal judge. 
a phenomenal human being. But not only that, she's put a lot back into the sport. Um, yeah. She mentors a lot of young judges. Uh, as an example, I was doing early on when I first started to do terriers, I was really unhappy with the, with the job I did. And Ginny was on the panel. I was talking to Ginny about it. About, about a week later, I get this huge sheaf of papers uh, with, um, with, you know, all kinds of information on all the terriers that she just sent me off. Uh, so I think, yeah, Ginny was one of the people that I that I really respected and that I that I thought were uh, people that were a person that was what you wanted to be when you were a judge. Um, another person that I that I really respect a lot is Ken McDermott, who you know. Uh, Ken is is really knowledgeable. I think he is was the or probably still is. He's not judging anymore, but he still is the terrier man of North America, as far as I'm concerned, maybe the world. Um, and he is a person that does what he thinks is right. Uh, he's an honest judge. He, he puts up the dogs that he thinks are the right dogs, no matter what they have done or haven't done or who's handling or, or them or who is not handling them. Um, so I really respect a lot of the things that Ken does. Uh, so I think more than anybody else, those are the two people that have really influenced me a lot. Uh, <laughs> those are two iconic members of the yeah. Judges Academy, for sure. Yeah. And you, you're. A, I, I, I uh, got to see one of your lectures, not your lectures, one of your your seminars when I was in Newfoundland, and you did a seminar on Labradors. And you, well, you are an educator by you are in the education world, right? You also are a basketball coach, aren't you? <laughs> yes, and I have a fractured finger from playing basketball with my 15 year old granddaughter. <laughs> it's, it says when you're 80, you don't go out playing with a 50 year 15 year old. <laughs> so you don't coach anymore then. No, I don't coach anymore. I coached in uh, I coached in high school. I coached for uh, assistant coach at university for a couple of years, but no, I don't coach anymore. But I still go to all my grandkids' games and all all my sons played college ball. Oh wow! Uh, so yeah, we're a bit we're a big basketball family. So I really That's enjoy the game. Fun. It's a it's a great it's a great game, great sport. It really is. But as I was saying about the seminar, I, I, you were such a natural up there at, uh, talking about Labradors. Obviously, um, you 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 had so much information about the beginning of the Labradors. So this is obviously, you know, you can tell that it's your your definitely your heart breed. But how did you compile all that information? Well, again, you know, I was uh, I had the background to do a lot of research. Um, it was, as you say, a breed that I began with and that I loved dearly, um, that I'm um, very committed to. But another thing about the breed is that over the decades, it's been generally fallaciously thought that uh, the Labrador is a British breed. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. This is the that. part I like. I mean, I'm glad you touched on this. Yeah, this yeah. is the part I like. <laughs> oh, I have to remember that. When England, I mean, England ruled the world, right? Yeah. And any colony that they were in, in control of, everything in the colony belonged to them. It did, didn't matter if it was a, an, 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 an antiquity in, in Egypt uh, or a dog in Newfoundland. That was theirs. So, of course, everything they claimed uh, was basically their, 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 their British English. Uh, but the reality of it is when you're back in the history and not only what the people say, but the pictures that you come up with, you realize that when when the dog was imported into England in the late 1800s, the dog had already developed as, as a breed. Generally, the idea was that the dog uh, originated in Newfoundland and was developed in England. But again, if you look at the pictures of dogs that were go that were brought into England, and you have to remember that the breed was recognized in England in 1903, where they were still importing dogs from Newfoundland in 1932, and not just anybody importing them, but people who were aristocrats, the people who actually really owned the breed in England and protected the breed. And all these breeders said, uh, we've done everything we can to protect the breed, to keep our pedigrees as pure as we could. Were some things bred into the dog, into the lines? Yeah, 
they were, of course. But generally, they tried to keep the breed as pure as they could. And that's everybody that was over there breeding them then said that that, that was what they were doing. And you have to remember, in England, the Labrador was a dog that was basically associated with the aristocracy. Uh, when the first wave of Labradors came over on, on the boats in the pool from Newfoundland, they were taken over by like regular people who were, you know, just wanted a dog that they could use to get meat. Uh, and they bred it with whatever they bred it with. But when the aristocrats saw what the dog could do and they took them into their kennels, then they kept the, the, the breed as pure as they could. And those are the dogs that the Labrador really developed from. Um, and we were just, the, the breed was just lucky that there were these, these men who were dukes and lords and uh, had a lot of money and a lot of power and a lot of wealth. And they, uh, they, kept, the, they kept that breed as, as pure as they could. So very fortunate because the dog basically did die out almost pretty much died out in Newfoundland because the Newfoundland government uh, had the idea that we're going to raise sheep in Newfoundland. Of course, like many government projects, that was a flop. Uh, and uh, But at the same time, they had put so, so heavy attacks on dogs, uh, particularly dogs that had not been neutered, that uh, there were basically no dogs left. So the last dog that was um, what we would call a pure water dog that had nothing at in Newfoundland, that had nothing at all bred into it, uh, died um, in the early 80s, I believe. But if you look at that dog, I had some slides of him, as you remember. Yeah. Uh, that dog looks exactly like a Labrador. I mean, it is a Labrador. It just never left the island. Um, so basically, I think the reason I feel strongly about it, of course, is because Newfoundland is my... And my ancestral home, as it is the dog's ancestral home, it's the breed that I love and that I that made whatever reputation I have in in dogs. Uh, and it's a Canadian dog. I mean, it's it's some part of our heritage. I mean, all of these things are are parts of our heritage. The Newfoundland dog, the Canadian Eskimo dog, the duck toller. I mean, those are part of Canadian heritage, and they played a big big part in our in our history. Uh, dogs in Newfoundland were never um, used uh, or thought of as pets for the longest time. They were thought of as ways to keep uh, to keep you alive. I mean, dogs in the front, people in Newfoundland were very, very poor. Uh, and so a dog was a, was a tool. Uh, and so the dogs basically did self-selection. It was Darwin at its at the strongest, right? They developed as they developed. So uh, the, breed, um, the breed was fortunate that they had protectors uh, in England that protected the dog. And that's what the English have to be praised for, congratulated for, thanked for, that they kept the breed alive. Right. But they didn't develop it. And one of the great things for me, anyway, is that the, the Canadian government, or, or the Newfoundland government, just passed a uh, member's bill that uh, recognized the Labrador and the Newfoundland dog as indigenous breeds in Newfoundland. And believe it or not, every member of the House voted positively for that motion. So you can just imagine now that anything that comes up with politicians and they all vote yeah. You can get every dog agreeing to vote on one thing. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs do bring people together. They so, sure do. They, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that's just been passed a couple of months ago. And uh, a person that was very involved in that was uh, Siobhan Cody. She and her husband, Pat, have some wonderful Labradors, and they're in Newfoundland. She also happens to be the of the, uh, the deputy prime minister and the minister of finance. So uh, we had a pretty powerful help with that but she's yeah. done a, doing a great job with dogs in newfoundland you saw some of her dogs at the uh, at the uh, seminar and i mean she's got dogs a dog that's won westminster twice now in the last two years and was select dog at the potomac which is the great labrador specialty so um so she's doing really really well and she's helping other people in the province uh, well, working with other people in the province to, to to keep the breed going there. So, yeah, it's another person that needs to have a lot of uh, a lot of praise sent their way. Sure does. I when I was there, the, the breed ring I judged earlier that year too. But the breed ring, it was 
you could you'd be happy to have almost any one of them in your breed ring. It was incredible. So yeah, there's uh, the entries. I was fortunate. I was asked to judge the I guess the hundredth anniversary show or something last year before last, and uh, the dogs that were there. There weren't many, but the dogs that were there could uh, and have competed. Uh, Anywhere. anywhere in North America and do extremely well. So that's one. Unfortunately, the Newfoundland dogs are just the opposite. Uh, the, it's really, really difficult uh, to find any Newfoundland dogs in Newfoundland right now. Not just really great ones, but any ones. And that's what the early explorers in Newfoundland said. The hardest thing to find in Newfoundland is Newfoundland dog. And these little short-haired black things were running around everywhere. But nobody paid them any attention because they were just common dogs. What they really wanted was the Newfoundland dog, right? Mm. But they were hard to find in Newfoundland even back in, in colonial times. Wow. Oh, we got a history lesson, too. That's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> we'll turn it back to dog right. shows. <laughs> now, you've, you've judged for 50 years now almost or, or close to it. You have some dogs in your history banks. Which ones really stamped you with certain breeds? Try to I don't, try not to talk about dogs that are being shown now, obviously, but uh, dogs that you've, you've seen over the years. You can even start off with Labradors, I guess, because if you can talk about Labradors of the past. Which which Labrador was stamped in your head? Oh, wow, there are so that's a difficult question it because is. there are so many really good dogs that you see over the years. And unlike Ken McDermott, I don't have this kind of a photographic memory that can remember every dog. And <laughs> he every was amazing, wasn't he? And you know who the dog's <laughs> grandparents were. Uh, so that was, a, that was a kind of a tough one. Um, there was, uh, there were some really, there was a beautiful, beautiful bitch in, in, um, in uh, England that I, re that I recall in Labradors anyway. And uh, her, uh, she was owned by uh, Peggy Ray Cornlands, and the name of the bitch was uh, Cornlands, my fair lady, and she held the record for uh, for bitches for a long for a long time in England. Did you get uh, to judge her? No, I didn't judge her, but I saw her because I had bought. Uh, I went up to Peggy Ray's, and uh, she had a litter of puppies. So she said, oh, she was a wonderful lady. She said, okay, here's this litter of puppies. Um, look at them and tell me. And it was a big litter. It was about 12 puppies. And she said, look at these puppies now and see which ones, you know, you, which one you might like. And so I said, sure. And I, I mean, I was total novice here, right? So I looked at the puppies and she said, now, she said, over here, when she had another little kennel, she said, these are the two puppies that I think are the two best ones. So she said, pick one of those puppies, and I'll keep one, and you keep the other one. Uh, so whichever one you want, you can take. So it was a, oh, my, it was a yellow, 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 two yellow males. So I picked one of them. Beautiful puppy. Again, six months started to limp. <laughs> Had him x-ray, HD. Called up Peggy and said, uh, told her what happened. She said, I'll get the other one x-rayed. If the x-ray is clear, he's yours. X-rayed, HD. Uh, but when I was up there, and I, you know, I had to remember that I was in the breed for all of uh, of one year. And she said, I can't find anyone to breed to uh, to my fair lady. Like, who would you recommend? And I was like, you you got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> well, I had no clue. But I did see the bitch, and I did go over the bitch. And she was just, she was in a, to me, she was just a phenomenal um, Really, a really beautiful, a really beautiful bitch that uh, that I thought that I thought a lot of. Do you have any photos of her? I don't have um, I don't have any photos, uh, but there are I'm sure in all of the uh, a lot of the probably lab books and lab everything books, okay. that, that they that they have. And she was a pretty she was a pretty outstanding uh, outstanding bitch. Um, what dog so, that you've judged over the years have made an impact on you? That you can recall. Uh, that's a problem. It's, the problem is recalling them. Uh, well, it's Ken McDermott, it's funny. Ken McDermott and Ken Murray both have phenomenal it, memories. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. I yeah. mean, that, 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 like with me, someone will ask me, 
10 minutes after I come outside the ring, what did you think of, uh, of this dog? And I went, uh, what dog? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's, uh, and I don't know that, I mean, seriously, you know, I don't know the names of the dogs. I don't know half the names of the people. Uh, I can, I know, for example, in Bolt, in, uh, in Staffy Bulls, which is another breed I really love, that I was in, uh, in uh, Australia. And I got this Staffy Bull Terrier and I looked at it and I said, oh, mother of God, this is like just the most beautiful thing I've, you know. And uh, so I ended up ended up giving him Best in Show. And uh, he, for me, really stuck out in my mind of, as what a great, uh, a great Staffy would, would be. Uh, and that was kind of about just asking me what his name was. I had... I have no clue. Uh, um, so yeah, don't ask. Don't ask me the name dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but as long as they're they're stamped here, like I would, uh, even I, I, I haven't been judging as long as you. But I've seen a lot of dogs in my lifetime, so I have so many stamped in my head that I I recall. Like I'll be going through say Irish setters, and I'll recognize a family of Irish setters in my head, and it goes back to a certain dog. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and so the, yeah, the the image of the the image of the breed is stuck in my head, and then as you know, as you'll find out as you go further and more along, but you've got a really big background in dogs, so I mean you've already established a lot of these images in your head. But what I found was when I was going through that sometimes you get very comfortable, so comfortable with the breeds, you can just see the dogs walk into the ring and they go, oh, okay, this one, this one, this one. I've got to look at them, but the rest of them. Uh, well, I'm going to go over them because they deserve to be gone right. over and they deserve to be given uh, every chance. But this is a dog uh, that I, I looked at and I say, oh, yeah, this is a, this is going to be one I have to really look at carefully because it's going to be competitive with this one over here. Um, and it, it, it suits the standard very clearly. Uh, and then there's other breeds that, that you know, you work on hard uh, all the time. You're always working on those breeds and trying to make sure that you're actually doing the the right, you know, the right thing. Uh, so over over a long period of time, you get breeds that you have this image in your mind and this image is sticks there. And some other breeds, there's uh, it, it's not as easy. And I think for people that come from uh, from breeds like Labradors or or Breeds that you know what you see is what you get, like a Doberman or a Roddy. That coated breeds can often be more difficult than uh, um, than uh, than than short coated breeds. You you really have to get your hands on on the on the uh, on the coated breeds and really go over them really really carefully because, uh, I mean, I'm sure that uh, somebody like Nigel or Bill who looked at a peak could tell you know from a hundred yards away whether that peak was a was a was a good peak or a great peak, uh, but the rest of us have to really get in there and and have a closer look at it. I have to tell you though, like over the years showing dogs, and someone asked me about certain judges, I did find that Labrador judges were good type judges overall, like in my in the sporting group. Yeah, I found I, I don't know if it's because they. I think the Labrador has, there's different styles, obviously, but there's definite type that I mean, people say, oh, a black dog type and the yellow dog type. Well, there there, there are different styles, those two colors. Uh, you might find a, a deeper type or more consistent type in the black dogs. But mm -hmm. because of those variations and the chocolates, I've, I have found over the years showing dogs that I enjoyed showing to Labrador judges because they seem to have a handle on type in other breeds they were judging. Well, I think in Labradors, you, you, and I mean, again, in Flats or Goldens um, or Chessies, you can't, as, as, as examples, uh, you get used to the, to the solid color. So people say, how can you judge a, a ring of like 35 black bitches in Labradors? Uh, and it's just automatic. It's not something yeah. that I think, oh my God, they're all black and what am I going to do? Uh, whereas somebody that comes from pattern braids or when you get into pattern braids, the pattern on the, on a braid can make like split faces on, on smooth Fox, right? You're wondering, you know, people wonder or that dogs has totally different markings on one side than on the other side. Uh, but I think perhaps when, for judges that come from solid colored, uh, colored braids, uh, or braids that have one pattern like a Roddy or, or a Dove, I mean, 
uh, that you're looking at a breed and you're looking for type. It's not just the color. You're, you're not influenced so much perhaps by color or by markings. Um, so you're looking at the at the outline. I mean, I think that's where every judge. I mean, uh, I think when, when when we first go into the ring, we look at the outline of the breed and how does how does that outline fit the breed or does the dog in there fit the outline? And so you look at the outlines. Uh, and then you start looking at the small details, uh, and then you move them and hope to God that they can they can move. Because as you know, you see a beautiful dog and you say, "Oh my God, standing still, this dog is just magnificent." And then the dog moves and it goes, <laughs> and uh, on, on, raw, on raw everything, right? <laughs> or or you hope that the dog has teeth uh, when you open the mouth, right? Uh, so I think that we get that idea after for. The best way to become a good judge, in my opinion, is to judge. And that's a problem in Canada, I think, with people who are coming up as judges, that they don't get the opportunity to see a lot of dogs in a breed. And that is becoming a problem in the U.S. too, because as you probably noticed, some of the shows that were once a thousand dogs are now 250 to 300 dogs. And so they're getting shows that they're not just handing out ribbons. Um, so it's really important, I think, for, for young judges coming up to have the opportunity to see uh, 35 line runners or, uh, or 40 Roddies or, uh, you know, 25 Norwich. Uh, we don't, we don't have that opportunity in Canada. And now in the U S it's, as I said, getting to be that they're not, a lot of them are not going to have, are having, not having the opportunity either. So, um, I don't know what we can do about that. It's just one of those things that, uh, is happening with the sport and uh, as you know we're all kind of worried a little bit about the sport and where it's and, and and how it's going to develop how it's going to transition into the next uh into the next generations because when you look around the dog show ring you notice there's an awful lot of old people and not a <laughs> heck of a lot of young people and uh you know when i get to be one of the younger judges on a panel i start to worry <laughs> where's the judging community going to right uh so I think we need to we need to do some some serious thinking about how we can develop the sport, uh, or we're not going to have a, a sport again. If you notice, a lot of the a uh, lot of the clubs are run by two or three people uh, who uh, who are not very young, right? And uh, after a while, the club just collapses, and uh, and that's um, it's happened to some of the really good clubs in Canada and. I'm talking talking to Charlie uh, August in, in the U.S. and I um, mean he he and, and his uh, and uh, his group are like the, I think there's uh, there's like three or four people that run a, a series of really big shows and when and he, Charlie is not in the, you know not in the best of health uh, but if anything happens to these people like Charlie and then the show is is going to uh, going to collapse so like he and Liz and and I think maybe one or two others run a run a run a, run a big circuit, and uh, it's uh, it's it's hard, uh, particularly when you get to be 70, 75, and uh, you just can't put in the same amount of energy that you have when you're you know forty or fifty or you know you're really old. You know you're really old, and you think of someone who's fifty as really young, right? <laughs> she naturally oh, answered my next. Yeah. You naturally answer my next question. I was going to ask you if a young person came up to you and said they wanted to become a judge, what advice would you give them? But you you kind of already answered for me. Um, is there anything else you would expel upon to this person if they came to you and said? Because you you did answer it, but it meant there might be something else. Yeah, well, I think one of the things is you, you, you can never get self-satisfied. You can never think that you know everything. Uh, I know when we started, to introduce uh, judges education in Canada. And I was very involved with the uh, CDJA. And in fact, we set up the first uh, institute of judges education in Toronto. The CDJA did that by itself and uh, invited judges to it. A lot of the people who were older judges were very resistant to that. They mm-hmm. thought, I've been, a, oh, I've been an Aubrey judge for you know, 20, 25, whatever years. And none of these young people can te- tell me anything. But uh, I mean, I think they were obviously very wrong. Uh, we've mm. got some young breeders who were 
phenomenal and are doing wonderful things. And they might be 30 or 35 or 40. And uh, they know a tremendous amount about, 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 about their breeds and, and about other breeds, but particularly about their own breeds. But so I think one other thing is we never, we never should become complacent and think that we know everything or that we know even most of it. Um, I think the other thing is that you go to people and you listen to what other people have to say. And uh, then you can make a decision on whether this is something you want to incorporate into your judging or not. Uh, but I think you have to be open to listening to people and uh, to what they believe and what they think the breed should be. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of people that I know in Labrador who are good friends and who have a very different opinion about Labradors than I do. Uh, and I'm sure that's true of, uh, of every breed. Uh, oh, sure. As an example, I, mean, I was judging in Finland, and a person who was a good friend, a friend and, and uh, asked me to uh, to judge the uh, little Labrador specially. And uh, I had two dogs at the end uh, of the of the of the day, and I picked one. Uh, one had a head I just couldn't live with. And afterwards I said to, uh, she asked me what was my decision on the two breed between the two dogs. And I said, well, I mean, the, the one that I didn't use, I mean, I couldn't, I mean, the head was horrible. She said, oh, I judged that dog a couple of weeks ago and I thought it had a wonderful head. Uh, now this was a Labrador breeder who was, you know, very experienced. Yes. So, I mean, you, you get that, uh, people who will disagree on a, on a breed. So just because somebody said something doesn't necessarily mean that you have to incorporated into what you think but i think you have to listen and right. see if you could possibly be wrong uh the other thing i think that we have to do is as i already mentioned is make sure that you um get as take advantage of as many educational opportunities as you have as you have available to you uh and not just look for a piece of paper or a certificate that says uh, okay uh, you've attended this but to actually try to learn um and I think the other thing is you have to judge. You have to get out. If someone offers you to do a owner handled in the U.S. or to do baby puppy or to do any show in the middle of nowhere, uh, you have to think. Yeah, I, I should go. I should take that opportunity to find out about find out find out about about the dogs that I'm going to be judging. Because again, I think as we talked about at the seminar in Newfoundland, uh, that judges have a responsibility. To, to educate themselves and to do the best job that they can possibly do. So, that sounds kind of like preaching, doesn't it? No, uh, no, no, but, no. Uh, yeah, and I think that's, I mean, I think that's, I think that's really important uh, for young judges to, coming up. And I think the other thing is to recognize that, I mean, there's a, there's a famous quote in, in, in English literature uh, from Leonard Wolf that says that the, the, uh, the journey, not the arrival, matters. And I think it's the journey, becoming a judge, that's what's important, what you learn along the way, not to become suddenly you know, three groups, four groups, five groups, all great. It's to go and learn what you can and everything you can learn. And when you're satisfied that you know what you're doing, then go on. It's not a race to the finish. Right. It's, it's, not, it's not get uh, get all breed, and uh, and then that's it. I don't have to do anything else. I'm, I'm I've, I've reached, you know, the pinnacle. Um, so I think that's another thing. And we all want to, we all want to finish, whatever we start, right? I mean, if you're doing a test, you want to get to the end of it. If you're you're running a race, you want to run, you know, get to the end, see what happens, and win. Um, but I don't think that's a mentality that you can have if you're judging. I think you can't say uh, I just want this you've got to say well I want to progress and learn what I need to learn so that I can be good at what I'm doing uh, so that's I think that's that's one of the biggest one of the biggest problems uh, and that I think a lot of young judges and I know that I was like that myself uh, feel rushed I, I have to do this if I don't if I don't do this in a, in a certain amount of time if I don't do this quickly, then you know I must be a good judge, or I'm not, I'm not doing what everyone else is doing. Um, so sometimes they have people have to slow themselves down. If uh, if someone asks you to, uh, I can remember, again anecdotally, right? And I don't hold myself up as any kind of model for this. Uh, but 
I was doing a Labrador show in uh, uh, early in my career and uh, in uh, in California. And uh, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, I like what you did in Labradors. And I said, thank you very much. And she said, well, I would like you to judge for uh, for our club. And I said, that'd be wonderful. What's your club? And he said, well, it's a, it's a poodle specialty. And I said, no, thank you. I'm, I don't feel that I could. I was I was licensed for poodles, but I didn't think I could do a a poodle, especially uh, in the U.S. with maybe 100, 200 poodles. I just didn't have the experience. I said I can give you some names of people that I think would be do an excellent job for you if you wanted someone who you know would do that. But I think people, is again not holding myself up as any kind of a model, but I think people have to realize their limitations. So if someone says, "Yeah, let's come and judge." Uh, you know, 400 of these dogs, and you said, well, I've only seen two in my life, but I'll go and do it. You're going to get into a hell of a lot of trouble. <laughs> right. Wow. So it uh, sort of brings me next. What do you, how do you feel about our judge, our process, our judging process to become a judge up here in Canada compared to other kennel clubs you've, you've been working with? Well, we're always kind of held up. I guess, compared to, anyway, the American system and American judges. Uh, My opinion is that we have great judges in Canada and we have bad judges in Canada and Americans have great judges and they have bad judges. Uh, So it's not something that's a kind of a national characteristic. Uh, Because of the situation that we're in in Canada, and we're the second biggest country in the world, we have the second biggest land mass, and yet we have about 37 million people. I think, you know, California, New York State have more people than we have. Uh, So you have this huge expense. So you have to say uh, either we're going to have a number of people who can do all breed judges, who can act as all breed judges, because a lot of the shows are less than 175, particularly when you get into far, far morals. You know areas, so you either tell those people that uh, you can't have a dog show because they can't afford to bring in three or four or five judges who can only do a group or a group and a half each, uh, or you have to supply them with judges. Uh, the U.S. is different. I mean, I believe that if you have three to four groups in the, in the U.S., you could judge every weekend if you want. Uh, have, it's a different situation. We need up up here. We need judges who can cover a lot of breeds. Or we need to tell people, clubs, that they can't have shows. Uh, and then the, and then the sport will die up here. So our process is faster than the U.S., no question about it. Uh, do people go through too fast? Yes, I think we do. Uh, but if people are dedicated and really want to be good judges, uh, I think that we have some... Examples of people who have gone through the Canadian system and have uh, have ex- have become exemplary judges. Um, I've been working with the events officiating committee, which, as you know, is the committee with Canadian Kennel Club that looks at all the rules governing judges for all of the disciplines. But looking at confirmation in particular, uh, I think. We need to make the process uh, more challenging, uh, which is going to slow people down, which is going to uh, raise a lot of hackles, get people pretty upset about what's going on. Uh, but I think that it's it's necessary. We have to try to get um, people to see the breeds more clearly, to understand the breeds, to know what's essential about the breed, about any breed. Uh, At the same time, I think we really have to help uh, uh, people who are becoming judges to get uh, that, to get that opportunity, to get the education opportunities, to get the judging uh, opportunities. Uh, So do we have problems in the Canadian Kennel Club system? Yes, there's problems that, I mean, every club has. uh, in England, as you know, most of the judges are, are breed judges. They they judge one breed. But when I lived in England and, and when I showed over there, uh, everybody knew that Gwen Bradley had a bitch that just had two CCs and needed another CC. Uh, everybody knew what dogs were winning and what and what you know what was going on. Uh, so some uh, pundits said. When they took off the uh, rabies, when they allowed the dogs to come in and into uh, 
uh, and to England with after the after the rabies situation was kind of resolved, uh, that half the judges in England would have to uh, turn in their license because they didn't know the dogs. They just know who they just knew who was who. Now I didn't say that. I want you to point out. I'm just saying that some pundit said that. Whether it was true or not, I don't know. But obviously, that person thought that England had a judging problem too. Uh, and we talk to a lot of American judges. I think you'll find out that they feel that they have some judging problems. Uh, so, yeah, we have judging problems in Canada. And uh, I think we're trying to resolve them. I think the CKC and uh, committees like EOC and CDJA are, are providing opportunities for, uh, for people to become better judges. But people have to take that, have to take that opportunity. Right. It's up to that's up to the individual. I honestly believe that if they want to learn, there's ways for them to learn. So there we, yeah. have, we have what we call our box checkers and others that actually want to advance. Right. And I mean, it's, it's someone wrote in to uh, to EOC talking about how uh, how are we going to uh, make sure that people who do online seminars, for example, are actually at the seminar. Right. So somebody will, you know, be there, turn on their iPad and uh, and have the seminar running, but they're off, you know, watching the hockey game or the basketball game. Or no, <laughs> no, the playoffs. No, no names, no names <laughs> attended here, Will. <laughs> uh, but sometimes the Celtics are running them. Uh, but, yeah, you know, you have to, uh, you know, I mean, obviously you have to take advantage of it. If it's just, as you say, checking boxes, uh, you're not going to learn anything. Right. Uh, and it's a it's a learning it's a learning process. And if you don't learn anything, it does come out in the wash eventually. You'll find yourself in the middle of that ring with going. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm like God, I mean, I, you know, I can still do I can still do that. Get in the middle of the ring and like God, what am I doing here, right? Uh, but I mean, I've no, I knew a real good a, a, a good young judge who could have uh, who could have gone on to become a really good judge, and uh, took an assignment that he should never have taken and ended up in the ring. A uh, judge that knew a couple of breeds in the group that he had applied for, but didn't know any of the other breeds. And when he got into uh, into the nitty gritty, he just absolutely screwed up. And a lot of people started complaining and about it. And he became so upset that he just stopped. He just didn't want to go anymore. Uh, and he never did become the good judge that he really could have been. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, you have to know yourself, and you have to know what you can do and what your limitations are. Um, but it's um, it's it's in, it's important that people get the opportunity, but then they have to realize that this opportunity is, in a sense, a kind of like a two-edged sword. That they have to know what they're doing because if they don't, then it's really going to be detrimental not only to their career, but I think to, to their own concept of self. I mean, I. It must be horrible to stand in the middle of a ring and think I, I know nothing about any of these uh, any of these dogs. Right? Yeah, it's true, Doc. So where uh, where are you going next? Anywhere? Because you're always busy. So are you taking a break, or you already have something on the horizon? Oh, I've got a few shows. <laughs> 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 Uh, the next one is going to be out in uh, Washington State. I'm doing, oh, uh, I'm doing a show out there, and then I'm doing uh, Woodstock. Well, that'll be fun. And that should be fun. I have to go back to the 60s and get out my tie dyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so I've, then I've got some shows in Canada. I'm doing some specialties in that, and the lab specialty, and uh, been asked to do the American National Labrador specialty again. Um, so yeah, I'm doing some shows in, uh, in New Orleans and in, in Jersey. So yeah, it's, it's, busy. Uh, it's, it's fairly, it's, yeah, it's just as busy as I want to be. Let's put it that way. I, 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 I've always taken you as this year. You're, you're, you're such a modest guy. Um, but yeah, Mr. Michael, you are one of our role models. I'm sorry to tell you. So <laughs> It's just that's, the way it is. That's so, kind of a frightening responsibility. Uh, <laughs> I, th- I can name you someone that I think are better role models. But, well, that's uh, a different perspective, though. See, we're yeah. looking at uh, our perspective. Uh, like, I would never say I was a role model as a hockey player. I was never, like, I, although I'd love to have been. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would have liked to, done, to have done that basketball, too, for sure. <laughs> My dream was always the dunk. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know how white men can't jump? That is true. <laughs> <In my case. laughs> uh, I've always enjoyed watching you judge. And when you're on uh, a panel, I look forward to that panel. It's always been that way. So thank you, you are a role model. Thank you. And I try not to call you doctor because you always get upset, but you are a doctor. So. Yeah, well, it's it's something that I that I use at, at when I was when I was working that you use at work all the time, right? But yeah. generally, in just everyday situations, it's not something that uh, that I that I you know want. So um, I'll try my best just to call you Michael. <laughs> <laughs> hey you, it's good. Uh, <laughs> now, thank you. Well, those are very kind words indeed. And uh, you know, as you get near the end of your career, it's, it's kind of nice to know that people that you respect think that you've done a pretty good, a pretty good job. And so, when uh, when you know, say people like Ginny think that you that you that you've done good, uh, that that's important. Uh, and yeah, and you feel and you feel like that. And as, as you said, I. I've been very fortunate in that I've had some wonderful people that uh, that have helped me along in the process, and uh, even um, even in obedience. When I started obedience, uh, the the person that mentored me was John Blinky, and I don't I think John Blinky was yeah. like the as far as I know the Labrador or the uh, the uh, obedience uh, authority in Canada. And so, as I said, I was really so fortunate and to get all these people who said, yeah, sure, we'll help you out. And, uh, and who kind of kept in, you know, who kept in touch, like Ginny and I are still working together on the events officiating committee. And, uh, um, yeah, Skip, as I say, uh, Skip was a, a, a dramatic, uh, loss to uh, the, the dog show. And uh, I love that. I loved him. He was such a, and I think everybody loved him actually, because if you look at, uh, if you look at that, remember the little one thing they used to have in Canada if, of, of all the of butt judges that are no longer with us, would you like to uh, ask for dinner? And yeah. if you ever look at that, I think about 70% of the people who wrote into that always said Skip Sandwich. He was such a phenomenal character, but he, uh, but he was, I mean, he was a he was a humble man too, uh, and, a, and a very funny man. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was I was glad that he was uh, consider him a friend. He was he was yeah. great. And I still keep in contact with Ken, and, uh, you know, right back and forth. And uh, that was a scary experience, by the way. Judge and Cherry and Ken McDermott sitting by the side of your wing. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a, I think, oh my God, this man knows more. You know. Knows more than I than I would ever dream of knowing about Terry Harris. Right? So uh, it's it's been a great it's been a great road for me. Uh, I'm really uh, I'm really happy that I got involved in dogs. They changed my life. Uh, I've done things and seen met people and seen places uh, that I never would have uh, never would have seen uh, or done. Uh, well, we're all happy you got involved in dogs as well. So. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm very. I'm very pleased that at the end, as I say, getting near the end of my career, that people think that you know you've done a good job. Well, thank you, Doctor. I won't keep. Uh, thank you, Michael. I won't keep you any longer, and I appreciate your time. And I'm sure I'll see you somewhere. I hope so. Yeah, it'll be. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you, Will, and. Uh, uh, somewhere along the around the rings, we'll uh, we'll meet up and have a chat. And, uh, exactly. Okay. Take care. Bye bye. You too. Thank you, Michael. I, I knew that was great, and, and I I honestly believe what I told you. You are a role model to us all, and thanks for doing this for us. If you like what you're seeing here, press the like, share, and subscribe button, and don't forget about the podcast, The Dog Show Drive with myself and Wayne Cavanaugh, and I will see you down the road.